Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for being here today as we kick off our very first webinar of the 2024-25 year. My name is Devin Simmons, and I am thrilled to serve as a STEM Lyceums Program Manager. I'm excited to dive in today's resume workshop, where you'll gain valuable insights on creating, enhancing, and tailoring your resume for success. I encourage you to take notes throughout the session to capture actionable tips that will elevate your resume to the next level. CEE was founded in 1983 by Joanne De Janeiro and the late Admiral H.G. Rickover, who is the father of the nuclear Navy and civilian uses of nuclear power with a mission to nurture high school and university scholars to careers of excellence and leadership in STEM. CEE's mission is to nurture high school and university scholars to careers of excellence and leadership in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and encourages collaboration between and among scientific and technological leaders in the global community. You may visit CEE's website to learn more about the center's cost-free programs for students and teachers, such as the Research Science Institute, USA Bio Olympiad, Teacher Enrichment Program, and STEM Lyceums. More about the program CEE offers, Highly, uh, Art Research Science Institute, or RSI, is a highly competitive six-week summer in science engineering program open to rising high school seniors. Juniors are eligible to apply. RSI is the first cost-free summer science and engineering program that combines on-campus work, coursework in scientific theory with off-campus work in science and technology research. The USA Bio Olympiad is the premier biology competition for high school students in the United States, provides the motivation, curricular resources, and skills training to take them beyond their classroom experience to the level of international competitiveness. Since CEE began administering the USABO in 2003, every member of the USA Bio Olympiad team has medaled at the IBO. The Teacher Enrichment Program, or TEP, provides opportunities for middle and high school teachers to connect with leading experts from industry and academia, explore cutting edge research and development, make meaningful and make meaningful professional links with direct benefits for you and your students. And then STEM Lyceums is the newest initiative at CEE, which is a virtual club for high school students to engage in discussions and exploration of STEM concepts or career pathways. And today our speaker, Today as our speaker, we have Hillary Turnipseed. Hillary is the Senior Director of Talent at K4 Capital, an early stage venture capital firm based in Oakland, California. Her work focuses on supporting impact-driven organizations that are dedicated to closing gaps and uplifting low-income communities and communities of color. Hillary primarily works with tech startups, helping them craft effective hiring and people management strategies, her expertise spans across all business areas and experience levels from internships to leadership roles, ensuring companies build diverse, inclusive, and high-performing teams. Hillary received her BA from American University in Washington, DC. After graduating, Hillary worked for a retained executive search firm, DHR International. From there, Hillary supported in-house recruitment and people operations efforts for notable organizations such as Discovery, Black Girls Code, Politico, and Blackboard. We are excited to have Hillary, and I'm going to let her take it away. Thank you for the introduction. I know we have um, a, a little under an hour. I want this to be as interactive as possible, so please do not shy away from asking any questions throughout, but we could also wait until the end. Um, while this workshop will definitely be focused on um, your resume, we're also going to talk about just the job search in general, the interview process, sort of how to navigate that, and then just additional sort of tips and tricks I always find important to just keep in mind as you navigate just the job search in general. So as Devin mentioned, this is just a quick snapshot of my background. Um, I'm based in the Bay Area, um, and really I work to help um, really guide our, our investments, our startup companies, and really helping them hire in what I refer to as a consciously inclusive way. I'm not here to help anyone check a box. It's really just making sure as they're using technology to close gaps in access that really support low income and communities of color, I'm a firm believer that your workforce, your company um, employee demographic, 
should mirror the communities that you are serving. And so my job is to really connect incredible talent with these companies directly. And as Devin mentioned, I support internships all the way through C-suite leadership positions. Okay, let's dive in. So in terms of resume sort of tips and best practices, I'm just going to highlight some just general tips that I um, think can apply to sort of anyone regardless of where you are in your search. If you're still in high school, this is a little bit more geared towards high school, but this can also follow you in college and just throughout your career, especially as you're entering the workforce full time. So the rule of thumb is your resume should be one page per 10 years of experience. So especially this early on, your resume should be short and sweet. Only one page, you wanna use bullet points and you wanna have very clear formatting so that it's easily scannable. And I always recommend if you're applying somewhere or if you're sending it in an email, always send it as a PDF versus a Word document or a Google document. That way you're not worried about any of the formatting changes, um, but you can just rest assured that exactly how you want it to be is showing up on someone else's computer. And you also want to limit any images um, because if you're applying on um, online somewhere and you're going through the actual application process, Sometimes, depending on the system that that company is using, it might not show all the images or all the characters. And so really just make sure you're focusing more on the words, the content versus any imagery. You want to keep it short and sweet because recruiters are really only looking at resumes for five to seven seconds. And so you really want to make sure you get everything across as clear and as quickly as possible. So that way they can make a pretty quick determination if you're the best fit for them. Obviously, you're going to have very limited work experience this early on in your career. So when you're thinking about building out a resume to start things off, especially if you're applying for your first job, what can you put on your resume? So I'm going to go over a few different things that you can put on there. I always like to start with highlighting any extracurricular activities, anything you're doing outside of going to class. So any clubs that you're a part of, any sports teams that you're a part of, any leadership positions, if you're on the yearbook committee, student council, this is really wanna, where you want to highlight all the things that you're doing in addition to your core um, work at school. Think about any volunteer work that you've done or any projects that you've completed. Let's say you're really passionate about computer science, maybe developing an app. Even if you're doing it for your own personal enjoyment, this is something that you want to highlight that you're doing on top of your day-to-day -day schoolwork. So whether it's a volunteer opportunity, any personal projects, or if you're fortunate enough to have prior work experience, any part-time roles, these are, again, um, things that you want to highlight on your resume. And don't worry, I will give you a resume template, um, and we'll go over that in just a little bit. But when you think about kind of the bullet points on really where you want to highlight your background, this, again, is another area that you want to highlight so that way you have some really good content listed on your resume. Even if the volunteer work or the project is not directly related to the job that you're applying for, what you're really showcasing in your resume is that you have a work ethic, you have responsibilities outside of school, you're reliable, you're able to manage things outside of school and sort of take that on. Because again, the goal is to really showcase that you're able to do this in addition to your schoolwork. So any experience that you have outside of school that's really what you want to highlight. You also want to really be able to emphasize your transferable skills. So while this wouldn't necessarily be in sort of your work experience section, there's also a skill section that you could have. And this is where you want to highlight those soft skills that you have. So if you have great attention to detail, if you love writing, if you love research, 
Um, if you are a part of a team, um, a sports team, you're able to work in a team environment, you're able to collaborate. If you're presented with a problem, you like to solve that. So just think about some of the soft skills that you feel really, really good about, really good at. Um, and that's something that you want to be able to highlight too, because then it's signaling to companies what they can rely on you for, what they can count on you for. And again, it really connects a lot of the dots and adds a little bit more context to the extracurricular activities, projects, and volunteer work you've done in the past. And then in addition to transferable skills, think about the technical skills that you have. So I'm sure everyone or in some capacity has exposure to social media. So think about the social media apps that you feel really, really comfortable in. If you're working on Google Docs um, or Google Slides or Microsoft Office, PowerPoint, Zoom, you're on a Zoom call. These are the technical skills, the computer programs that you have exposure to. You don't necessarily have to be an expert in it, but any computer programs um, or apps or tools, whether it's Photoshop, Canva, anything that you are comfortable using and have had some exposure with, those skills, those programs, you want to highlight on your resume too. Any certifications you might have gotten, you want to list those. If you speak more than one language, you want to highlight that too. So this is where you can showcase more of the tangible technical skills that you have in addition to the transferable soft skills. And again, we're only keeping this to one page. Okay. Another thing you want to highlight, and this is, again, making sure that you're able to have, you're telling a really well-rounded story about yourself in one page. Um, your resume is essentially a marketing document about yourself. So it's going to be hard to capture everything. But again, considering you're um, still in high school, want to make sure that you can tell a really cohesive story. So think about any academic or athletic achievements you've been able to accomplish, if you received any honors, if you were on honor roll, the dean's list, um, any awards that you're a part of, any scholarships that you've received. Um, this is definitely another thing that you want to highlight in a section in your resume. Now, when you talk about the work that you've done in whether a project, a volunteer opportunity, um, or again, any of the extracurricular activities, when you describe the work that you were doing there, you want to use strong verbs to start your bullet points. So you want to use more action-oriented verbs like organized, led, created, things that you're really proud of that you were able to achieve. It's also really important to proofread. Have someone else take a look at your resume. If you're, if you're reading it over and over again, I guarantee you're probably going to miss something. And attention to detail is really important. I can't tell you how many times I came across a resume where the person had incredible experience, but there was a typo. That immediately signals to a hiring manager that attention to detail is not as important to you. You might make a mistake. I mean, mistakes will happen, but as important of a document as your resume, you really want to make sure it's free of any spelling or grammar errors. There's a lot of tools like Grammarly that I recommend you can put it through. But again, having a teacher, a friend, a parent, just a second set of eyes on your resume is going to be really important because you don't want to lose out on an opportunity for a small typo. But I've seen it happen. It's also important to be honest. Don't exaggerate um, or lie <laughs> on your resume um, because it will come back. You wanna be able to make sure you're setting yourself up for success. So if you're saying you can do something or have done something that you really haven't before, um, what that will do is it will impact your credibility and your ability to be successful in the role. So I'm not saying that anyone is going to lie. It's just more around just you. They're not expecting you to have all of this experience. It's really just being able to articulate what you have done, what you're proud of, but also what you want to do. So just be honest. When it comes to cover letters, um, 
Personally, um, I find that they are less and less commonly used these days. So my recommendation as sort of just a rule of thumb is only complete it if the, sp the specific application that you're using is requires it. But again, recruiters really only look at resumes for five to seven seconds. And so if you're applying for an internship, a part-time job, where there's going to be a lot of resume volume, chances are they're not going to take the time to look at the cover letter as well. So unless the application requires it, I would really focus more on the resume than anything else. And if you are going to write a cover letter, make sure you tailor it to the company and the position. Don't use the same one over and over again. And one other thing I also like to be mindful of and just make a side note for is be mindful of your social media presence. Keep your social media pages private. Um, I say that because there are a lot of hiring managers who will Google. Um, depending on the role, and this will be through college, through your early career, through later on in your career, this will follow you everywhere. Be very mindful of your social media presence because once you do work for a company, you then become a representative of that company. So anything that you put out there can reflect positively or negatively to the company brand. So to avoid any sort of issue, I recommend just keeping your pages private. Okay. I'm going to make sure you guys have an editable copy of this, but this is a general template um, that pretty much can serve you for quite some time throughout your career. This one is specifically geared towards high school, um, but if you are in college, you can just replace the high school name with your college name. With your work experience, this is where you can also put your volunteer experience, you put the company name. Now, if you don't have any of that information, then you can put projects or activities. So not all of these fields are required, but this will basically give you the format of how you can bucket all the information. You have your additional skills at the bottom, your awards, and you can remove anything that doesn't directly apply to your background or experience. And again, you want to keep it to one page. So no more than two to three bullet points to describe the work that you've done. Okay. Now the job search. These are just going to be some general search tips and tricks, especially as you're just navigating the, okay, I know I want to work. I want to get a part-time job or full-time job for this summer. Where do I find a job? So I'm just going to give you some general recommendations of where you could start. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are the most common resources that I found has worked, especially when searching for a job while still in high school. Leveraging your network. So think about your immediate network. Who do you know? Most jobs, you know, are really um, around who about who you know, not just going online, which is definitely um, a common thing, um, but you want to basically put yourself in the best position to have your background viewed and give yourself as much of a competitive advantage. So a lot of ways you can do that is if you have someone referring you. So think about your immediate network, whether it's family, friends, teachers, guidance counselors, neighbors that you're close with, if they know of any op job opportunities that are specifically suitable for high school students. So that offer part-time flexibility for you to work after school, weekends, summertime, seasonal. I got my first job in high school from a recommendation from a guidance counselor. There are a lot of companies that will reach out to high school guidance counselors specifically looking for high school students. And so your guidance counselors, your teachers will sort of be that first line of defense to know of opportunities that may not be posted and geared towards high school students. So think about who you know, who you're close with, who are in positions of leadership, and, you, and just it's truly just letting them know that you're open. And then that can then allow them to start networking and reaching out on your behalf. And that's a good way to really start having opportunities sort of come your way. 
When you do make the ask, you also want to be able to explain the type of job you're looking for and why you would be good. And so, and we'll go over different types of jobs in a second, but when you make the ask, in order to really help them help you in the best way, let them know your availability. Hey, I'm looking for some extra work on the weekends. I, ha I actually finish classes at 3 p.m. so I could do something after work for after school for a few hours. Or hey, I'm looking for something just in the summertime. Be very clear on the type of job you're looking for, um, any limitations that you have, um, and. And honestly, this is a way to state your case and say, hey, listen, I feel like I'm very responsible. I do X, Y, Z. I participate in these activities. And I really want to showcase my skills in another way and provide value to any organization or person or company that could be hiring. So think of this as a quick sort of what they call an elevator pitch. But be very clear on what it is you can do your availability and why you want to do it. That makes it easier for guidance counselors, teachers, friends to then advocate on your behalf because you don't want to be in a position where you're asking for help and they're coming back and you can't say yes to those opportunities because it didn't fit your criteria. So the clearer you are up front about your needs and your bandwidth and your schedule and your availability, the easier it will be for them to match up opportunities. Don't be shy about asking for introductions or referrals. It's really about the ask. I know plenty of people who are more than happy to help as long as you ask. Don't assume people know. Don't assume people are assuming that you need help. Be very direct and very clear on the ask. So don't shy away because there are people who probably are not going to raise their hand and ask. And so the more you do, the more, again, you're giving yourself that natural competitive advantage. As people start responding to you, follow up promptly and professionally. The worst thing that you can do is get a request for an interview or you're recommended for somebody and you don't follow up. We're on our phones, we're on computers all the time. Check your email, make sure your phone's not on, you know, I'm gonna say do not disturb because you definitely don't wanna be disturbed during class, but make sure you're following up and checking in on a daily basis because sometimes it's about speed. And if they don't hear back quickly enough, they'll move on to the next person who was available. So please be prompt and professional and also proofread your responses, especially if it's in an email. Again, those typos can definitely make or break an opportunity. Now, the types of jobs you can consider definitely um, will vary. So for anything with, you know, usually sort of flexible hours, seasonal opportunities, consider jobs in retail, restaurants. There's a bunch of office jobs, whether it's filing, answering the phone, reception, front desk. Academically, people are always looking for additional help tutoring, whether it's, um, you know, other students in your grade or younger students. There's always tutoring opportunities available. And you can let teachers and guidance counselors know that, hey, you're available and willing to tutor in these areas. And do they know anyone who's in need of tutoring services? Seasonal jobs like holidays, spring break, summertime, those are perfect for high school and even college students, because again, they typically work around the times where you're not gonna expect it to be in school. So it's a lot easier for you to juggle that. During the summer times, especially, look at opportunities at local parks, recreation centers, summer camps. When I was in high school and in college, I was a summer camp counselor every summer. Those jobs often pay really well. They're also usually tied to your school district. So again, letting teachers know, guidance counselors, your communities, you know, that's a great way to really get something secure, at least in the summertime. And it's great um, great experience all around that will follow you um, throughout your career. And in this day and age, there's also a lot of virtual or remote or work from home opportunities. So there are often companies looking for, um, you know, project-based help where it's like, hey, help me post on social media, help me come up with 
um, with certain posts or captions or just general content to help their brand and marketing or even graphic design. If you're really creative and you like creating things, you like storytelling, that's an opportunity where you can provide a lot of value on a very flexible project or part-time basis. There are companies often looking for research help, data entry, a virtual assistant helping schedule, managing their calendars. And a lot of these roles, they're often very much willing to train. Um, and so don't shy away from raising your hand for any of those opportunities if you haven't directly done it, because nine times out of 10, they're willing to train too. They're just looking for folks who are willing to do that type of work. So good news you have been invited to interview for a position. In order to make sure you're putting your best foot forward, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some just general best practices to really help make sure you're giving yourself that competitive advantage over someone else who might not have taken the time to truly prepare. It's very, very important to know who you're interviewing with, not just the person, but the company, and to know the role. So look up the company, look at their website, Google, see what you can find on them, see if there are any recent articles about them, but just get a general sense of what the company or organization is. And then in terms of the position, the job description, if you're able to get one, if there is one, that is your, that is going to be the tool that will pretty much give you the outline of what is going to be expected of you in that role. So make sure you know exactly what the company does and exactly what's written on the position description. Now, sometimes there might not be a job description. It might just be a couple of bullet points or it might just be a conversation. So if you're just only able to get information on the company and not the job, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure to come prepared to ask questions about the job in the interview. So some common interview questions that I always think it's good for you to have a practiced answer to. Normally people will tell you, hey, tell me a little bit about yourself. Why do you wanna work here? So this is again, part of that sort of elevator pitch with sort of your ask. So think about how you wanna speak about yourself. You want it to be short and sweet. Say, I'm a, I'm a high school sophomore, I'm a high school senior. I participate in these sports or these group activities. I am really passionate about this and I'm looking to gain exposure in different areas to help prepare me for college and beyond. Why this role? The schedule works for me. I think I can do the job based on what is being asked. Um, but these are things that you really want to be able to speak to and have a general response ready to go. Dressing professionally. Now, I typically say that this is more suited for positions that are going to be in an office setting or in a retail interview setting. If you're having a conversation about um, working at a park or at a camp, at a summer camp, it's definitely more casual. But at least just for the interview um, process alone, you want to make sure to choose neat, more business style clothing. You want to avoid jeans, anything with rips in it, any sleeveless shirts, no shorts, no graphic tees, no flip flops. Just, you know, very more just neutral colors, um, as professional um, as possible. It doesn't have to be a full suit, um, but just a little bit of a step up from casual at a minimum. If you are meeting in person, it's always good to come prepared and bring in copies of your resume. Even though they have it in their email, it's always good to have at least two to three printed one page copies with you just in case they don't have it readily available. And you can say, hey, here's my resume in case you don't have it. I can't tell you how many times that's come in handy. Now, if it is a virtual interview, that won't be necessary. Whether it's a video call or it's in person, you also want to be mindful of your body language, maintaining eye contact, a firm handshake, sitting up straight. These are just some minor cues that you just want to be very mindful of, again, to really showcase more of that professional um, setting that you want to provide. I think we have a question. 
we do have a question um and this is again for those that are in the audience let me turn my video on so not just a random guy talking or a random voice um but for those in the audience please we're going to have a question and answer portion um hillary is open to questions during her her presentation so feel free but if there is any questions please please send them during the question and answer portion. Um, but this question asks, how do you list your experience, education awards, and so forth on a resume? Do you list from past or current one on the top? Thank you. Yeah, so I, let me go back to the template. So you wanna put past and current and under sort of activities or additional, you'll see right here, there's like certifications and training, languages, technical skills, awards. This section, if you have a lot here, it's totally okay for there to be more in these sections versus you know, actual applicable work experience. And so I would use either of these sections, activities or additional to showcase um, any awards, activities, sports teams that you're a part of. This is where, th those are the sections that you'll put it in. And these are just um, suggested um, ways to format it. And so it might not be directly applicable, but this is a general format that you want to follow, kind of the name. You can put, you know, football, you know, your school's football team, and then you can put your position and then how long you've been doing it. You might not have every single bullet point for everything, but this is a general format that you want to use. And in terms of whether it's past or present, um, you really want to focus on what you're doing during high school. Anything in middle school or earlier is not necessarily going to be as relevant. So any, but if it was your freshman year and now you're a senior, you want to talk about your full high school experience and what you've done throughout the years. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Hillary. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so we ended off with um, with body language and um, also as a rule of thumb for any in-person interview, plan to arrive at least 10, sometimes 15 minutes before your interview, not too earlier than that. There is a such thing as too early that could be a little uncomfortable, but plan to arrive um, a bit early to give yourself some time um, to sort of get acclimated, maybe use the restroom beforehand, um, but you definitely don't want to be rushed and you don't want to show up just, just on time because again, you want to make sure you have the full experience and you're not feeling rushed. And then for video interviews, I always find showing up three to five minutes before the video interview starts, that's typically a good rule of thumb. No need to show up much earlier than that. Because again, it's just a video. Um, and always make sure that you're kind of testing out your camera, that you don't have any technical issues, your internet connectivity, make sure there's no distractions in the background, especially if it's a video call. Okay, so now these are just general questions I always recommend to come prepared to ask. An interview should always be a two-way conversation. And so just as much as they're going to ask you questions, you want to be able to come prepared with a couple of questions for them too. So these are just general recommendations. Um, asking them, hey, what does a typical day in this internship look like? Or what does a typical day look like in this role? It doesn't just have to be for internships. It's for any position that you're applying for. Um, what opportunities are there for mentorship or professional development? Now, if this is in more of an office setting um, or if it's something where you really haven't done this before, ask them, are there, is there training? Will you offer training? Be honest. Oh, I haven't done this specific role before. Would you? Do, is there training involved? Is there someone I could work closely with in case I have any questions? So you don't have to ask it this exact way. Um, but these are just, you know, general things that you can apply, whether it's to an internship, a part-time job, um, or even a full-time job. You can always just sort of swap out the word internship with whatever the position is. Um, can you describe a successful project that a person in this role before has completed? Now, this is more probably geared towards more traditional internships versus maybe a retail role or a role in a restaurant. There might not have been a successful project, but if it's an in-office setting, um, there could definitely be some opportunities for projects to be completed. So that's where this question would come into play. 
Um, now, whether it's a corporation or a restaurant or a retail um, environment, asking them what the biggest challenges are will definitely help you get insight into where they probably need the most support. So sometimes the answer will be, hey, we're having trouble with people showing up on time and consistently. Now you know that's really important to them and you're gonna make it a point to show up on time and be consistent. But it also gives you more insight into the big picture of why the, the, the need is there, why this role is open. And that will give you a good way, um, good insight into how you can be successful in this role. And depending on where you are um, kind of in your career process, um, especially when you get to college, um, a lot of internships could eventually lead to full-time positions. And so asking them, hey, long-term, have you ever hired people full-time after this? Or, hey, when I graduate, could there be opportunities to increase my hours? Or if you're starting off during the school year and you want to stay on during the summer, hey, is there potential to stay on and increase my hours in the summertime because I will have more time to do that? So thinking about different ways that you can stay employed, adjust your schedule throughout, um, that's a good, um, these are always good questions to ask that you're thinking long term. And then after the interview. These can often help, again, give you the competitive advantage over a candidate who didn't do this step. But I always recommend sending a thank you note within a day of the interview. Um, in an email, it doesn't have to be written or mailed, um, but just, and if you don't have that person's email, Ask them for the ask them for their email in the interview, and just a brief just a brief email, just thanking them for taking the time to meet with you. Reconfirm your interest, express your interest in the role. Be like, after meeting with you, I'm really excited about the opportunity. Thank you for so thank you so much for considering me. Hope to hear from you soon. You can even ask, do you know when you play, you can ask in the interview um, at the end or in the email if you haven't heard back, do you know roughly what time, like what your decision timeline will be? Because that way you can also follow up if they don't meet, if you don't hear from them within that timeline. I always find it's a good practice to reflect on the interview after you've had it. Think about what went well, what you could have done better, because you don't want to stop after just like one interview. You want to continue to interview until you get a job. And so any reflection that you can do to really improve your interview experience overall, it's always good to reflect sort of right after while it's still fresh in your mind. So that way, again, you're more prepared next time. Um, in terms of follow-up, like I said, it's okay to ask after the interview if they have a timeline. If they don't get to you within that timeline, it's always good to follow up, but don't follow up before the timeline. Give them time to honor that. And then references. Um, going back to what I mentioned, don't embellish um, or lie on your resume. It's most companies will ask for references. And so in this case, it could be from a teacher, a guidance counselor, or someone you've worked with before in another role, but have res references ready to go and give them the heads up that there could be any outreach. So as you start the interview process, as you start the job search process, especially if you're asking your teachers and guidance counselors for help, at the same time, you can also ask them, hey, would you also be comfortable being a reference for me? That way you already have it teed up, you already have it ready to go. I saw there was another question. Yes. So this question is asked by an anonymous, anonymous attendee, and it says, should I list everything in each section chronologically? So I always start with um, most recent to latest. So you want what you're doing right now or your most recent role at the top and then you go down um, to your past experience from there. Okay. Um, and I also mentioned this before, but don't stop looking for other opportunities until you hear back. Um, very rarely is it sort of a one and done, but if you have someone directly referring you to and being the advocate, there's a good chance that you'll probably hear something pretty quickly and you have a good shot, but 
wait until things are official before you totally stop those efforts because it's a tough market in general. It's very competitive. Expect every person to go after the same roles that you're going after too. And so don't stop um, until you hear back. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up with just like general sort of additional tips and tricks to just sort of keep in mind. Now, when it comes to pay negotiation. Most job postings um, will have a pay range listed. Um, even if it's coming directly from the school, usually they're, they tell, hey, we're willing to pay you know, $20 an hour. Like It, it really just depends. Um, but most will have those pay ranges in mind. If a range isn't listed, it's okay to ask in that initial conversation. I would wait maybe until the end, see if it comes up. Don't have it be the only question you ask, but it's okay to ask, hey, do you have a, a pay range for this role? Do you have a budget for this role? That way you know. Don't wait until the end without getting that information um, because by then it's already like, it's just, it's a little too late and you want to know what work is going to be expected of you and how you're going to be compensated early on to know if this is a good fit for you. You might decide it's not. When it comes to new hire paperwork, how do you get paid? How do you get brought on as an employee, especially if it's a little bit more of a formal um, formal setup? So everyone has to have proof of work eligibility. So that's typically done in the form of a few different sort of IDs, either having your social security card and your ID card, driver's license if you have it, but you know a general state ID should work. Um, or your birth certificate. So sometimes it's just gonna be your social security card and your birth certificate if you don't have an ID yet. Um, or um, in most cases, just a passport will do as well. So just make sure as you come prepared, especially on your first day of work, you're gonna need to have those documents with you to prove your work eligibility because they need to verify it in order to officially get you in the system. Um, for payroll, so you know there are certain cases if you're babysitting or you're doing tutoring and it's a little bit more informal, most of the time you're paid in cash, but in the event you're doing something a little bit more formal, you're working in retail, you're working in an office setting where you're brought on, you know, um, officially on their payroll, they will typically ask for your bank account information to do a direct deposit. Sometimes they'll do a physical check for you if you don't have a bank account to directly deposit in right away. Or some companies, depending on how large the company is, they will have debit cards that will be preloaded with your payment. Um, now, again, this is if it's um, a little bit more of a formal work scenario, but most of the time for some of the seasonal work, a little bit more informal, you can probably expect to be paid in cash or maybe Cash App or Venmo, depending. Now, when you're on the job, always be on time for the duration of your employment. If you're gonna run late, give them the heads up that you're running late, try not to make it a habit, but we get it, like emergencies come up. But what employers and future employers are really gonna look for, could I rely on this person? Was this person dependable? Was this person a person of their word? Um, so you want to make sure you're always putting your best foot forward, even after you get the job. You always want to dress appropriately and professionally. Ask them if there's a dress code up front for summer camps um, or working outside. They usually have T-shirts that will come with the role anyway. Some have uniforms um, or just general dress codes. So that's a question you can actually ask either during the interview process or when the role is offered to you. Always find ways to be useful, especially if you're in an office setting or even if you're a restaurant or retail. If you have periods of downtime where you don't have anything to do, take the initiative. Ask someone if you can help take something off their plate, if there's something that you can help them with. People are remembered for how helpful they were too. Not just have you shown up on time and are you reliable? Were you helpful? Did you strive to go above and beyond? They're going to remember that. But if you're just sitting there waiting to be told what to do, um, one way to really set yourself apart is to take that initiative and say, hey, I actually wrapped this up pretty early. I have some bandwidth. Can I help take on anything else? Can I help you with anything? 
Always find ways to be useful. Avoid distractions. Limit any personal phone use. If you have a company computer, don't use it for any personal reasons. I mean, email is fine, but avoid distractions. Don't be on your phone all the time. Put it on silent. Put it on do not disturb. Again, you want to always be mindful. Be focused on the job at hand. So do your best to avoid distractions. Also, it's okay if you don't know how to do something. They're, ex they're not expecting you to be experts. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Ask for support. If you didn't catch it the first time, it's okay to ask them to repeat it. Take down notes so you can refer back to it later. But don't be afraid to ask for help. Because most people make mistakes when they refuse to do that. Now, at the end of the employment um, position, especially if it's a seasonal role, always keep in touch with the manager. Ask them if they're going to be if they'll be willing to be a reference for you in the future. Because as you're looking for internships, entering college, or even that first job out of college, it's most employers will want to be able to talk to someone who's managed you in the past. And so ask them at the end, hey, can I keep in touch with you? Will you be a reference for me in the future? And usually nine times out of 10, if you did your job well, they'll say yes. Um, you also want to be able to keep the door open to return in the future, especially if it's a seasonal role. And so by keeping in touch with the manager too, or asking in the interview, hey, you know, if this summer goes well, will I have a chance to return next summer? These are, and you perform the job well, keeping the door open and return in the future, showing that longevity and that long-term work with one company is a really good story to tell. And as you complete work, Put it on your resume while it's still fresh in your mind. You always want to keep your resume updated. Um, and it's a lot easier to do that once, you know, you've finished a role because you can remember pretty quickly all the things that you've done. It doesn't have to be perfect, but document that experience so that way when you are ready um, to start applying again, you already have that experience in there ready to go. First off, thank you so much, Hillary, for that information. Uh, okay. This is our question and answer portion. Um, so if you have any questions, please drop them in the question and answer chat. I do not want anybody to miss this opportunity to ask any questions, whether it's about resumes, about interviews, or anything of that nature. And so I do have some questions. Yeah. And so my first question is, what should I do if they decide to go with another candidate? This is after I've done the interview process, I've sent in my resume, my application, um, and then they just decide to go another way. What should I do then? Yeah. So as I mentioned before, you know, don't stop interviewing. But if you do get that dreaded rejection email, a lot of employers and even recruiters will remember how you handle the rejection. And if you handled it really well, sometimes, you know, their first choice maybe won't work out. And then they can reach out to you later and be like, you know what, they handled it so well. Like, let me see if they're available. Because trust me, hiring mistakes do happen, and I see it all the time. So in the event you do get an email um, that um, is letting them know they moved in another direction, always reply and say, thank you so much for considering me for the opportunity. If anything changes, I would love to be reconsidered, and I would love to keep in touch for any future opportunities. Short, sweet, to the point, um, because again, you always want to keep that door open. Even if they're closed, you could still crack it open a little bit, with just, um, you know, acknowledging the rejection in a professional way. You don't have to reply if you don't want to, but if it was a company or a role that you were really excited about, always take that extra step. Now, some people, and I've seen this sometimes, will ask for feedback. Hey, was there a reason why you didn't pick me? This is always a little tricky. And if you're going to ask it, you also have to be prepared for them not to answer. Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, there is no real reason. It was just, oh, this was the first person that came through. And so this is the first one that went. And so I would actually, I mean, this is from my perspective as a recruiter. Um, the best way to ask it is more indirectly. If you do want feedback and say, hey, if you have any feedback that could help me improve 
my interview experience moving forward, I welcome that. I welcome that feedback. That gives them the option to answer or not. But if you say, hey, do you have any feedback or why didn't I get it? Sometimes answering a question like that, they might not feel comfortable. So you might not get a response overall. But if you did want to see if you could get feedback by saying, hey, if there is any feedback that you think could be helpful for me, I would love to hear it. But thank you again for your time. Absolutely. I would word it that way to kind of give them the option to respond. And they could say, no, it wasn't you. We just went with this. Or they could say, oh, well, actually, you know, you showed up a little late or, you know, you're, it, could be, it could be anything really. But if you ask it in that softer way versus putting someone on the spot, um, you'll have a better chance of getting a response. But again, it's not really needed. It's only if something if it's important to you. But just acknowledging it, thanking them for their time and saying that you're open if things change and you'd love to be considered in the future. That's something that will definitely keep you in mind for them. Absolutely. I think um, in my all, my working experience and internship experiences, I think just remaining professional to the end is the best yes. way to go about things. And that's always just the thing to keep in mind. And so my next question is, when you were talking about resumes and um, working on typos and things of that nature, what are some other things or points of the resume that would cause a recruiter to not consider a candidate or look past the resume? Because I know you mentioned it takes about five to seven seconds for someone mm -hmm. to look at a resume. So what do they look at besides those typos that may stand out? Yeah, so there, it's really less about, so if we're, if we're talking high, sc high school and mm -hmm. college internships specifically, what they're looking for is a little different versus applying to a full-time role where they're expecting all of this experience already. Right. So aside from typos, what they're really looking at, truthfully, it's almost as if viewing it as sort of applying to college in a way. Mm -hmm. They're looking at what makes you you and what are you doing outside of what you have to do for school. Right. And so it's really around looking at all the different things that you have going on. Um, but if it's clean and easy to read and there's not a lot of things going on, that's really what they're looking for. Can I read this? Can I understand what you're saying? Does this make sense? There are a lot of times where there's a lot of designs. Mm -hmm. Some of it doesn't really make any sense or it's clear that I've seen this a lot where AI was used and but it didn't, but the answer didn't really make any, it didn't really yeah. make any sense. And so you want to be honest, you want it to be in your voice as much as possible. Um, and then maybe use some tools to edit it, to make it a little bit more polished, but we're not looking for you to have all of this experience when you're just in high school. We're just looking to see, Hey, what are you passionate about? How do you like to spend your mind and your time we don't expect you to have all the answers, but we want to know, hey, what do you do outside of what you have to do? Because you're asking us to hire you for something that's outside of what <laughs> you have to do. So it's really seeing if you're able to juggle that and all the, and you know, if you're in sports, you're like, okay, you have to be disciplined. You have to be on time. You have to work in a team. They're looking at all of those things to see how you would be to work with. Absolutely. And I think a thing that just stuck out to me was AI, making sure that you're not using AI or whatever resource to write your resume that is there to help make you any, any edits or any corrections, okay. but do not use AI to write your resume because there are things out there that can catch that in a hurry. So, And, I, and I, I, I'm telling you right now, they will know. Now, sometimes I'm depending, and this is more for internships, um, instead of just your resume, they will ask questions as a part of your application. They'll say, why do you want to work here? Or what, you know, more open-ended questions. This is really where AI can mess things up because I've seen a lot of applications where they've copy and pasted that question, put it in chat GPT, and then I've seen applications with the exact same answer. Right. So it's okay to use it for editing. If you're worried about grammar and proofreading, Grammarly is a great tool for that. Um, but 
it should be you <laughs> and you do, and they're going to be hiring you as right. the individual. So the more authentic you can make it, um, the better, but the tools are there to help enhance, not replace. Absolutely. They are looking for the person. Um, and so I have two questions in the question and answer chat. Um, and I think after that, looking at the time, those may be the last two questions okay. so that we can wrap up. But for the audience members, if you have any questions, please, please, please email me um, and I can answer those or I can get an answer from Hillary or maybe we can yes. extend this to another resume workshop. But please. Happy to. Happy yes, to. If you guys want me back, I'm hoping this is useful for you guys. I, I, um, I wish I had this in high school. I'll say that much. <laughs> but um, the first question is, how should I tailor my resume when reaching out to faculty at a university? For example, if I'm interested in professor's work and would like to reach out about the possibility of working under them, how should I reach out to, to them to give me the best chance of being accepted? Yeah, so if you're still in high school, um, or even if you're in college specifically, um, you wanna highlight on your resume the coursework that is most relevant to the work that this professor is doing to showcase like you already have some exposure to that discipline, that field, that area, and you want more of it. So there's a portion in um, your resume where you can put under um, your high school, your school name, I mean, it could be college too, and right underneath um, you know, the major, the diploma, you could put relevant coursework right underneath it and just put the names of the classes that you took. Um, but your resume is going to speak less in this case when you're really pitching yourself for um, something that may not be posted. So I almost view this as a little bit of a semi cover letter, but, you know, it's really in more of an email where you're really pitching yourself and saying, hey, listen, I have followed your work. I am very passionate about X, Y, Z. I took these classes, these courses. I'm specifically looking for experience and exposure in this, and I would love to be considered happy to volunteer, happy to help take things up, you know, whatever it is that you're open to doing in that moment. It's that piece in addition to your resume mm -hmm. that's going to tell the story. So it's sort of like a very specialized cover letter, but you have to be very clear in it of what you're asking. So you're saying, hey, this is why I'm interested this is what I'm interested in, and this is the exposure that I already have, and I want to add to it. Absolutely. And I think to the point that you made earlier um, about just reaching out, especially with college professors or any Huge teacher job. for that matter. <laughs> yeah, you you have to take that step and they'll appreciate that greatly. They may not. That doesn't guarantee a position, but it definitely puts you at the top yeah. of the list. And a great way to make sure you can get at least a response either way is Hey, if you don't have anything, if you know of any professors who would be interested, or if you have any recommendations on books I should read, you know, it's really just showcasing your interest in mm -hmm. that work and asking for support in some way. So if you give them a few different ways that they can help, usually they'll take you up on one of them. Yes. I have, being a former teacher and having gone to college, <laughs> teachers love when you reach out outside of just asking for extra credit. So um, make sure that you just send an email at, and take that step. Um, and so the last question, I'm pretty sure I know the answer for this yes. one, but it says, <laughs> is being a unpaid research intern position at a local university considered a work experience? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> anything, I mean, it's unfortunate that it was unpaid. <laughs> yes. But good. anything where you're proud of, which, where you did a project, you did, a, you accomplished the whole thing, <laughs> mm -hmm. that is work experience. Um, unpaid or paid, it doesn't matter. Volunteer, part time, it doesn't matter. Anything that would fall outside of work experience are activities, school groups. Um, sports activities, band, you know, any sort of activities, um, um, that's what would fall under kind of the activities. And then if you just had side projects that you didn't do this for anyone but yourself, like, oh, I developed this app or I created this thing, 
you can act, and if you maybe even have a portfolio, depending if you're really creative, you could put those projects in there, you know, build this tool on my own. Here's a link at the app store. Here's my portfolio. Design these things because I'm passionate about it. Right. That's where you can really showcase your work too under projects, even though you didn't do it for someone, you did it for yourself. It still counts. Absolutely. Anything outside the classroom that, that you work else. towards. That yeah. was not homework. Anything <laughs> yes. that wasn't homework. <laughs> Anything that wasn't homework. Um, and so with that, again, if you have any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask right now, please send them to me and I will send them to Hillary to try to get a response and get an answer. And again, if this is something that um, as an audience member you felt was very beneficial, please let me know so that we can keep this resume workshop going. Um, I understand that this is a big need in high school and in college. And so um, if you would like this to keep going, please let me know and we will make that happen. And so with that, I'm going to share... Uh, I see this last question. Will the recording uh, be emailed? Yes, the recording will be emailed to you. Um, you get beat me to the point. Or beat and we're also going to gonna send the template for the resume to. It'll be in a Google Doc that you could edit. Yep. Um, and you'll have that. And again, this is just a framework. It doesn't have to be exact. Customize it to your needs. And if it would be helpful in a separate section, a session, I'm happy to look at resumes and offer any um, suggestions around edits or formatting, if that would be helpful. Absolutely. When Hillary sends me that um, format or that that document, I will be send it as well as our thank you email and also the recording email too, so that you don't have an opportunity to miss it. And so with that, I just want to again say thank you so much, Hillary, um, for being sharing your information and sharing your knowledge. I know that this is beneficial um, for someone out there. And so um, just want to say thank you again, and thank you to all of our sponsors, including the Claude Moore Charitable Foundation. And lastly, thank you for joining us today. You will be notified when this recording is posted on your YouTube on our YouTube channel. More information regarding our next webinar will be sent out in the un, in the coming weeks, and we hope to see you there as we continue to grow within STEM Lyceums. And so, thank with that, I'm going to wrap up our first webinar of the year, and just want to say thank you again. And everybody have a great rest of the day.